Hey dummies, welcome to the inaugural episode of Unity Roundtable, a tutorial show where I discuss game design, programming, Unity concepts, and tools. In this episode, I'll be discussing Unity's visual scripting tool, which used to be known as Bolt before Unity acquired and integrated it as a native Unity system, like they did with Text Mesh Pro and Cinemachine. I recently made an entire game without having to write a single line of code thanks to visual scripting, and I think it went pretty well. It was my first time using visual scripting, and I can confirm that it's actually really easy to pick up. So for those of you with no programming experience who wants to start making games in Unity, but find c a little too daunting to jump in right away while still learning how to use the engine, stick around because Unity's visual scripting might be for you. If you're running a version of Unity below 2021, you have to add the Bolt asset from the Asset Store. Once that's done, you can go to your assets in the Package Manager window and download it. There will be a setup wizard, simply go through the steps, leaving most of the settings as is for this tutorial. If you're running the latest version of Unity 2021, visual scripting is included as a package and you simply have to open up the Package Manager to enable it in the Unity registry. For the moment, don't worry too much about the visual scripting settings. We'll go over stuff like the type options and node library in a future episode. So let's jump right in. There are two visual scripting components you need to know. Script machines, previously known as flow graphs in Bolt, and state machines. A state machine is basically a container that allows you to link two or more script graphs using transitions. Those are useful for objects in your game that will need to switch between different states where each state would need its own logic. Examples would include enemy AI or game modes. A script machine is where the bulk of the work takes place. It's where you'll be putting all the object's logic via events and nodes. Let's start with state machines. So let's say you're building a turn-based strategy game and your players have two stages they have to go through in each round, setup and actions. You can start by embedding the state graph onto your object by adding the state machine component to it. Then open the state graph in the graph inspector and create two script graph nodes. One will be the setup graph and the other will be the actions graph. You can set the setup graph as the starting one if it isn't already by right-clicking it and clicking toggle start. Starting graphs have a green edge at the top. Then create transitions to allow the game to go back and forth between the two states by right-clicking, clicking on Make Transition, and then clicking on the other node to set the transition's destination. For now, let's focus on these transition nodes. If you enter the first transition, you'll notice this node. Triggering this node is how you tell your game to transition from the setup state to the action state. Here's how you can do that. First, create an object variable called InActionStage, and make it a boolean that's set to false by default. You'll notice that there are several different categories for variables. They're quite simple, but we'll go over these later in the video. For now, you can right-click to create a new event node, specifically an onUpdate or onFixedUpdate node, in your transition graph that gets triggered on every frame. Note that transition graphs that are connected to the active script graph are always being executed alongside the script graph. Then we simply create an if node that checks whether or not the inaction stage boolean is true, and if it is, we trigger the transition node. With this, whenever the inaction stage variable's value changes to true, the state graph will switch the active script graph from the setup one to the action one. Now let's jump into the first script graph to set up what sets the action stage variable to true. You'll notice that you can see the script graph's events on the node that represents it in the state machine's components graph. These events are created by default and aren't mandatory, so you can remove the ones you don't plan on using. We'll go into details regarding event nodes in a moment. You can access the script graph by double-clicking. Now, before we start messing around in here, I'd like to mention that script graphs can be assigned directly to objects without requiring a state graph by using the script machine component instead of the state machine component. Let's take this UI object, for example. Let's say that we want this UI element to display the in-game time. For this, we wouldn't really need a state graph because it doesn't have different states to switch between. And since the time being displayed is unique to this object, we would be creating an embedded graph. So far, we've been working with embedded graphs, but there are also non-embedded ones, which we'll go over later into this video. Okay, back to the setup stage script graph. Once again, you can right-click to create a new node, but you can also drag the node's handle to have the node selection drop-down appear when you let go. The difference here is that the drop-down will try to show options that are relevant to the node you're trying to connect it to, as opposed to just showing you everything right off the bat. There are several categories of nodes, but the most important ones you'd need to know for now are the Control, Events, Logic, Math, 
variables and time. Control is for conditionals like if, switch, and for or while loops, the foundations of programming. If you're using Bolt in a previous version of Unity, some of these might be named differently, such as if being branch. Events are the starting point of your node paths. An event will activate and go down its attached nodes once triggered by certain conditions. The most commonly used ones would be the lifecycle ones, such as on update, on fixed update, or on start, the input ones, such as on button input, and the physics ones, such as on collision enter. Logic nodes are simple and are usually used alongside control nodes as conditionals, such as the greater than and less than logic nodes. Math is for mathematical functions. Whenever you need to modify or generate values for conditionals or variables, for example, seal and floor are used for rounding values up and down respectively, and min and max are used for selecting the smallest or largest value from a list of two or more values. And finally, time is for uh, time-based manipulations, whether it be asking the graph to wait a certain amount of time or frames before moving to the next node, or to use predefined functions such as cooldown or timer. In order to use these nodes, however, you have to make sure you set the event node to coroutine using this checkbox right here. Now let's get into creating the actual script. For the moment, we can keep it extremely simple and assume the setup phase only keeps track of time. Basically, you have one minute in the setup phase before moving to the action phase. There are a few different ways to do that. One would be the old-fashioned way by simply creating a countdown variable and updating it every frame, like so. This is a graph variable called time to next phase, and in the onfixed update event, we simply use a math node to subtract delta time from the variable's value, and then update that same variable with a new value. Once that's done, we use an if logic node to check whether or not the new value is less than or equal to zero. If it is, we set in action stage to true, otherwise we simply end the path of nodes here. Now as you know, once in action stage is set to true, the transition will trigger and will switch the active graph from the setup one to the action one. But there's an even simpler way to do all this without having to update variables, use logic nodes or math nodes, and that's time functions. If you set your unfixed update event node to be a coroutine, you can now simply use the wait for seconds node and assign it to the amount of time you'd like to wait. Whether that time be a hard-coded value or a variable is up to you. Once that amount of time has passed, the next node will be triggered, setting the in-action stage to true. That was a simple look into the two types of graphs. Now let's get into variables. There are five types of variables available to you when using the visual scripting system. Graph, object, scene, app, and saved. Those basically represent four different levels of scope, plus a special category. Graph variables are basically unique to the graph you're currently in. Other graphs and objects cannot access them, even if they're in the same state graph or state machine. Note that these variables do not reset to their default values when you transition to other graphs, so make sure you reset them in the graph's on start event. Object variables are stored on the object itself. This means other graphs can access them as long as they do so through the object itself. So other script graphs that are on the same object or in the same state graph can access access them, as well as other objects in the scene if you specify which object to fetch the value from. Like so. These variables can be accessed even if their associated objects are disabled. Scene variables are stored in the active scene, so all objects, state machines, and graphs in the scene can access them as long as the scene itself is still active. App variables are essentially global. These are just like scene variables, except they are also persistent across scenes. This means they retain their value even when you try to access them from a different scene. After destroying the scene, those values were initially set in. And finally, we have these saved variables. Those go beyond the app variables in the sense that they are saved on your hard drive and persist even when you quit or reload your game. These are handy for creating save data, such as player profiles, save states, or checkpoints. We'll go more in depth with how to create save states in a future Unity Roundtable episode. Now, there's still one more category of graphs that I haven't gone into yet. Those are the non-embedded graphs. Think of these like prefabs. They're stored in your project directory and are referred to directly rather than being embedded on an object or in the scene hierarchy. These types of graphs cannot access values from the scene hierarchy because they are scene agnostic, so you'd use these types of graphs for more universal functions that wouldn't really be specific to any one single object and wouldn't rely on any values from external scopes like scene objects. For example, if all your weapons are the same, you can have a single weapon 
weapon graph that they all use without you having to embed a new graph on each weapon. You can also create your own nodes, also known as units, but we'll leave that for part two. And that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in. Unity Roundtable is powered in part by my patrons, the dummies, and you too can join the dummy army by supporting me on Patreon. You can also vote on what you'd like to see in the next Unity Roundtable episode by responding to the pinned comment or the poll on my Discord server. See you in the next one.